Good morning, fellow Namibians, viewers, and listeners at home, and welcome to the COVID-19 Communication Center's daily update. We thank you very much for always joining us to hear information about COVID-19 in Namibia. This morning, I am joined by two guests, which is the Executive Director of the Ministry of Health and Social Services, Mr. Ben Nangombe. Thank you very much for joining us. As well as Dr. Eric Zuban, who is the Country Director for the Center for Control Diseases in Namibia. Thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure. This morning, we are going to talk about dispelling rumors and myths about COVID-19, all this misinformation, fake news that is going around about COVID-19, and we're going to get the correct answers from our two presenters. But before we get into that topic, I'd like to give the opportunity to the ED of the Minister of Health to give us a short update about what is the state of the health sector amid COVID-19 around the cases that we have that are positive, those that have recovered, those that are active, and issues around quarantine and so on. Edi. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister. Let me start by saying the reason for the establishment of this communication center, this media center, is to ensure that the Namibian people are given timely, correct, authenticated information as we combat the COVID outbreak. That is important. And that's why uh, stakeholders and personnel from the Ministry of Health and Social Services have made time to come here and to share information with members of the public. Because it is important. And I'm glad that a session for this morning was made to dispel incorrect information that is making rounds around the COVID response uh, in our country particularly. We are happy that the number of cases remain to be stable at 16. We haven't had new cases uh, in the past two days. So it's 16 cases, uh, 11 in the Commerce region, one in the Karas region, and four in Erongo region. We are happy that at least three cases have recovered. And that is, it, it's showing that our health services are able to handle this matter. Uh, around the issue of quarantine, we are again happy that the group that was initially uh, quarantined at uh, Greitas has since been released. The group that was quarantined at the Hardap Resort, the NWR Resort, has also been released. But with respect to the uh, group from the Hardap region, from uh, Hardap Resort, uh, there was a report, I think it's on, on, on NBC, which indicated that the people were quarantined because they were suspected or suspected cases of coronavirus. It must be clarified that the reason for quarantining is people who are coming into Namibia from affected countries. And we need to make a difference that a suspected case for corona is a case that meets what is called the standard case definition. Standard case definition being uh, for the first few weeks, we were saying the person must have a history of travel to an affected country must have perhaps contact with a confirmed case and must have the symptoms that are consistent with the coronavirus. Now, the people who are, are quarantined are quarantined regardless of whether they have these symptoms so that we give time of that 14 days to see whether the person starts to show the symptoms so that they can be tested. So quarantining does not mean the person is necessarily suspected of a case. It's just that they are coming from a country that is affected or a place that is affected and is potentially infected. But it's not that the person is a suspected case per se. Because uh, to talk about a suspected case, you are talking really about a clinical aspect uh, of the intervention. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Benfo, for that update and clarification around quarantine. Well, Dr. Eric, um, moving into the rumors and myths about COVID-19, there's a number flying around um, that alcohol can be used to, to ensure that you kill the virus if you might have it, um, especially around the notion that hand sanitizers should have quantity of alcohol that helps. Um, is that myth true? Yeah, well, it's very true that the hand sanitizers can help stop the spread of this virus. And the hand sanitizers do have alcohol in them. And outside your body, that's a great way to destroy the virus. But drinking alcohol or really drinking anything isn't going to make a difference. Uh, we've heard rumors about drinking hot water, hot water with lemon, even very dangerous things, uh, drinking certain things that are actually quite poisonous. Like detergents. Yeah, yeah. None of that's going to help. It'll actually hurt you. Uh, the virus, when it's in your body, it gets into your lungs and it lives there. When you drink things, those liquids, they go down your throat into your stomach. So in theory, uh, even if these things were helpful outside the body, in the body, they're not reaching where the virus is and they're not going to be helpful. What about eating garlic? That's another one we hear a lot of. There's no evidence at all that eating garlic helps with this virus. Um, it still spreads though, that rumor has <laughs> been out there for a long time. Okay, and there's also one that if you try to avoid eating cold foods such as ice cream and so on, you will stand a better chance of not getting the virus. Yeah, a lot of the rumors seem to have to do with temperature. Mm -hmm. People want to believe, I think there's some wishful thinking here. People are hoping that uh, temperature can play a role, that if you drink these hot things, avoid drinking cold drinks or ice cream, that this will make a difference. Mm -hmm. There's no evidence for that. Just like uh, there were a lot of rumors for a long time that the virus wouldn't come to hot countries yes. like Namibia. It would only spread in cold countries. Mm. And we clearly see that's not true. Some very hot countries have had many cases, mm. thousands of cases in some countries that are very warm. It's possible that the virus might spread better in colder weather. We don't know that yet. It's a new virus. We're still learning those kind of things. Mm. But we know that we are susceptible in hot climates, cold climates, the virus has shown its ability to get across the world. Because it has, um, I've seen that a study has been made that it um, has a lifespan on different surfaces um, that it is able to stay alive. So regardless of the environment, it can still survive. That's right. It survives for different amounts of times outside your body based on the surface, based on if it's in direct sunlight, uh, based on the moisture, if it's on a moist surface, we think it can last longer. Mm -hmm. So that could be tricky because we don't always know exactly how long it will survive on a given surface. Mm -hmm. And that's why we always go back to washing our hands, yeah. not touching our faces, mm -hmm. trying to distance ourselves from other people. So if we do get that virus on ourselves, on our hands, the good thing is it won't make you sick just by being on your hands. It's only when it gets into your body, like if you rub your eyes or your nose or your mouth, it gets in, that's when you can get sick. So avoiding the touching of objects that are shared between people and then washing your hands well, it'll make a difference. All right. Uh, Mr. Ben, we're getting consignments of material from um, different donors, including um, China. Um, and there seems to be an understanding in some members of the public that um, because COVID-19 originated in China, um, that whatever they send, most probably has the virus or it's, it's suspected to have the virus. What can you say about that? Yeah, again, I think as Eric pointed out, it's possible that the virus may exist on a surface for a certain period of time, but it cannot exist there forever and it, it, it should exist in certain conditions. So um, to say that an object coming from a particular place may be contaminated, that, that cannot be right. That cannot be right. And we cannot say that uh, producers of these items have not taken the necessary precautions to ensure that these things are safe. And, and these rumors are really destructive because uh, they spread unnecessary fear among members of the public. But it can really not be said that uh, an item coming from a particular place may necessarily be contaminated. No, that is not right.
Of course, um, I can relate this also to um, a lot of fear because, like I said, because the virus or originated from China, there are a lot of fears around interacting with people from China, Chinese people, or eating Chinese food. Um, is it safe to say that people should not have the fear or want to discriminate um, people of Chinese descent because the virus uh, originated from China? Discrimination of any kind is again counterproductive. We are saying that if a person is infected with a virus, that during that the, the incubation period, the, the symptoms will start to show. But it doesn't mean that just the person is from this or that racial background would necessarily be the carrier of a virus. It is for this reason that we are saying this virus knows no color. Yeah. It knows no ethnicity. It knows no boundaries. So we are all as suspect, susceptible as the next person. So to discriminate a person because of their nationality or because of their racial background will again be counterproductive. We are all in this together. And that's what the Director General of the World Health Organization said yesterday, that we are all in this together and we must join hands to know what the enemy is. The enemy is not the next person. The enemy is the virus. And that is what we must identify as the enemy and confront it in unity in order to defeat it. Mm. One last one to you around that topic. Um, a few days ago, or maybe a couple of weeks ago, the Chinese embassy in Namibia did donate um, some materials to the Minister of Health. Um, I don't know, some news or fake news was created around that to say that the donation was of vaccinations um, to, to, to the ministry for, for those that have been infected with the virus. Is that true? Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. And I want to uh, connect that to an audio that has been circulating uh, for some time in Namibia around the issues of vaccination and things like that. Uh, what I can say is that Namibia at the moment uh, is not intending to participate in any vaccine trials for COVID-19. We are not participating at all. If other countries around the world are doing that, uh, they are doing that because it's of, that's the decision they have taken. But Namibia is not participating in a vaccination process for COVID-19. So that rumor must be dispelled uh, forthwith. Now, the Chinese government and the Jack Ma Foundation have donated items to Namibia. This includes personal protective equipment and other items. Uh, there was also a consignment of uh, reagents. These are not rapid test kits. These are reagents that are used by the Namibia Institute of Pathology to conduct tests. Perhaps you could just explain what is a reagent for a, the a person re on the street who doesn't <laughs> understand what a yeah, reagent is. There is a, you see, when you conduct the tests, um, there is equipment called the PCR machine, polymerase uh, chain reaction, I think it is. And uh, that machine uses what you call the reagents. Um, and these are a type of cartridges that are put into this machine in order then to determine uh, whether the, 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 the specimen that uh, are brought are negative or are positive. But this is a scientific matter uh, uh, that can be better explained by professionals in that regard. So these reagents are what is used to conduct these tests. And that is what the Jack Ma Foundation donated. So, and I just need to add that uh, there has also been talk about why are we not uh, as yet uh, bringing in what is called the rapid test kits. Yes. The rapid test kits are used on site and they can also um, uh, uh, produce some results. But again, the, the use of rapid test kits, they still need to be uh, validated through a confirmatory test using the PCR technology. So we have not yet, as a ministry and as a government, uh, gone into the direction of using the rapid test kits. And there is good reason for that uh, on advice of our scientists. So uh, 
for now we are using PCR technology, but we are also planning uh, to roll out uh, another testing platform, uh, which is called the, using the Gene Expert machines. The Gene Expert machine also use PCR technology, but they produce results also much quicker. We have a number of those machines scattered around the country. We have about 20 or so of them in Namibia. And we are saying that once again, we also get the reagents for these machines, we would be able to do the tests in different localities and not send all the samples to Venduk for, for, for that. And again, we are bringing the private sector on board. Uh, as has been reported in the past, uh, some of our samples and our uh, specimens that were taken have been done through PathCare. And PathCare used to send these samples to the National Institute of Communicable Diseases in South Africa to do the testing. However, uh, when we met with PathCare last week, they have indicated that they have acquired the equipment uh, in order to be able to do the test locally. They are also just waiting for the reagents to come. And the reason why these reagents uh, are taking some time to come is also because there is high demand for them on the global market. Uh, but when we spoke to the suppliers, they are saying, I think in the next week or two, we should be able to get this in the country and we will then be able to conduct these tests. And again, this is also important because we are saying, uh, looking at the epidemiology and the dynamics of the spread of the disease, we want to get more data in terms of community or, com or, or local transmission of this disease. So uh, our health professionals have advised that we should extend the pool of the number of tests that, that, that we make so that we are not only going to test people who have got the classic case standard definition, but for example, patients who come to our health facilities with uh, respiratory ailments, we are going to test those. We are going to engage in what is called active case search, and we are going to engage uh, our health professionals and even our um, community health workers to go out in the communities and identify those people that may be candidates for testing. So all these things are done so that we have better data to understand the epidemiology, to understand the dynamics of transmission, and particularly to identify whether we have what is called local transmission or community transmission. So these are some of the things that the ministry is doing for, for us to be able to know exactly what the dynamics are of this disease in Namibia. I think the laboratory capacity is really growing here. And so we're seeing around the world, there's more types of laboratory tests becoming available. And as those are confirmed uh, to work, we'll bring them in. Uh, people should know that there's a real danger if you have laboratory tests that don't work well, that could cause a lot of problems in both directions. If you have people who have the virus, but the laboratory says they don't, then they're unaware of their diagnosis and they might be going around and uh, putting people around them in danger. At the same time, if you have people who don't have the virus, but the laboratory says they do, then we're spending a lot of resources and causing a lot of trouble for that person for no reason at all. So we need accurate tests. So that's why sometimes it takes a little longer for them to come in. They're all just being developed in the last few months. Of course, none of these tests existed before January uh, because this is a new virus. That's what's so challenging about this virus. There are thousands of viruses around the world, but when there's a brand new one like this and it spreads so easily, we have to start from the beginning as a world, as a global community. And that takes a while and uh, you see a lot of people moving very rapidly to try to get those resources everywhere, including here in Namibia. There are those who believe that the vaccine exists. It's just not being distributed to those that have tested positive and so on. What can you say about that myth? I wish a vaccine did exist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I wish it was being distributed around the world because that would be our best tool to fight this. Mm -hmm. There is no vaccine yet. There are vaccine candidates. Mm -hmm. That's what they call them when they're starting to work on them and test them that are being used in other parts of the world in trials to see if they work but we don't have a successful vaccine yet. When we do, people will know about it. You can imagine that those companies and those governments investing in making a vaccine, they're gonna want everyone to know because that's gonna be a very exciting day for them and for the whole world. Uh, it's just not here yet. It takes a long time. Again, starting from zero, starting from a brand new virus, it takes time to develop those things. Some say that 
usually vaccines take even up to 10 years to develop. In, in, in a case like this now of COVID-19, what are the projections that we could actually get a, a, va a vaccine that could actually um, be able to assist with, with curtailing the spread of the virus? What we're hearing the scientists say is that a best case scenario would be around 12 to 18 months. And that's starting back when this uh, outbreak first kind of came to the attention of the world right around the beginning of 2020. Some vaccines take a lot longer than that. There are certain diseases out there, certain viruses or bacteria that we have just not been successful at making vaccines against. HIV is a good example. We've had HIV in this world known to us for about 40 years almost now. Uh, we've still not been able to come up with a vaccine for it. It's a very tricky virus. The way it operates in the body makes that vaccine process so difficult. Uh, we are hopeful that, that the coronavirus vaccine won't be like that, that we'll be able to develop one more quickly. Certainly scientists around the world are trying. There has been a audio and so on and information circulating around 5G networks causing um, COVID-19. Of course, as MICT, we would want to um, tackle that specifically from a technological perspective. But from your perspective, from a health perspective, could you just give us information about those that actually believe that 5G networks actually cause COVID-19? There's no evidence at all that they do whatsoever. In my understanding, you would know this better than me, I don't believe there is any 5G in Namibia right now anyway, so it really just wouldn't even make sense here. But it brings up a good point. There's, there's two categories of myths that I've noticed. Uh, one is things people want to believe because it helps them make sense of a situation that feels very uncertain, very confusing. Uh, if you can have a belief that fits with something you already believed, let's say you're a person that's really distrustful of your government, or you don't trust a certain group of people from a country, or you think technology is making the world a more dangerous place, having a myth that fits with that maybe helps you try to make sense of what's going on. The other category is things that maybe give us a sense of control. Uh, if we think that there's a thing we can drink, or a vegetable we can eat, or something we can do, or something about our country protecting us, that feels good. That feels like we have some control in a time in this world that feels pretty out of control. I believe that's why a lot of these myths keep spreading and why people choose to hold on to them. The good news is, if we look at the real facts, if we look at the truth, we can both make sense of what's going on and regain some control in our lives. There is a lot that we've learned about this virus in the last few months, and it's the kind of truthful information that you're putting out here uh, on this show every day, even just written on these banners behind Mr. Nangombe. There is good truthful information that can help us make sense of what's going on, and there are things that bring a sense of control back. Knowing what we can do, especially in this lockdown, socially distancing ourselves, we see it beginning to work. We see that we can gain some control on protecting ourselves from this virus, fighting against this disease. So the more people are looking to those truthful sources, the better off they'll be. And when you get one of these myths on your phone, let's say through social media, before you spread it around, really look at it and say, do I know this is true? Am I certain that this is something worth spreading? If not, just put it away. So, so from what I'm getting from the both of you is at this point, prevention is really better than the cure. Uh, taking the necessary steps to wash your hands, to avoid touching your face, practicing social distancing, that goes a longer way than either getting a vaccine or believing that certain things are true or not about the virus. I think what is important is to ensure that we do what we can now. Vaccines is pointed out take a longer time to develop. But what can we do now to protect ourselves, to protect our families, to protect our communities? And it's exactly doing what has proven to work. And the question of hand washing, social distancing, and so forth, did not only start in Namibia. This has, is what has been proven to work in other countries. Uh, in China, they locked down whole cities when they realized that the virus was spreading exponentially. And we in Namibia have said, we need also to act decisively. 
And that is exactly what we did uh, with the president uh, declaring the state of emergency. And 10 days later, then uh, looking at the lockdown of the two regions. Why? Because we want to make sure that we control the spread of the virus in localities where we have seen it spreading. And I think this strategy has worked very well. We are standing at 16 cases. We are expanding our testing capacity in order to determine whether there is local and community transmission. So that is what is going to save our country. That's why we are saying each and every Namibian has got a responsibility. We have a duty to protect ourselves by complying with the measures that have been put in place. That is very, very important. And I want to, to address one issue. Um, that was raised in the, in, in the audio that I referred to earlier. And that is, for example, a claim, uh, somebody claiming that they are 100% sure that there are no coronavirus cases in Namibia. Country men and women, we all have access, or most of us have got access to the media. We listen and we hear what is happening around the world. This virus is real. It's killing people. And the only way that we can protect ourselves is when we limit the spread of this virus. We have seen that our, our scientists have demonstrated to us scientifically by testing people who have got symptoms. And the results have come out. The results have come out. This is a positive case. And we have been open to communicate them to members of the public so that we know. So we cannot bury our head in the sand and somehow have this wishful thinking that there are no cases here. The virus is here and that is why these measures are being taken. This should not be spread because it's a dangerous, dangerous uh, practice. Another one is that there, because there are no deaths of corona, it means that there are no corona cases and therefore health officials are not telling the truth. Again, we are saying the cases are here. Some were confirmed outside Namibia. Yeah. So it's not only Namibia saying that we have cases here, we have cases confirmed outside the country. And what we are saying is we, we, we have a health system that is treating these people. Three of them have recovered. What does that mean? It means at 48 hour intervals, they have been tested and tested negative after having been positive. But we still have cases that have tested positive and have been testing positive consistently over time, which means they have not recovered. So, these issues are serious issues and it will serve us well as a country, as communities, as individuals, if we listen to the authentic information coming from the sources that know what is going on. So let us stay away from the fake news that is making the rounds and listen what the ministry is doing. We have health professionals, dedicated health professionals working around the clock, risking their, to, lives. risking their lives to ensure that the rest of the country is protected. Let us not demoralize them by spreading information that undermine this very important effort. That will then be self-defeating. Thank you very much. Mr. Eric, would you like to add anything before I give over to the media to ask some questions? No, I think it's very good points that the ED raised and that focus on health workers is really critical. Uh, they're doing incredibly brave work. They need to be able to protect themselves, but they can't do that by staying home like the rest of the country. They have to go out to the hospitals and the clinics to help protect us, to make sure that people getting uh, sick with COVID-19 or anything else, we still have all the other health issues we had a few months ago. So they're out there providing treatment providing testing, helping keep us safe and healthy, we can support them by not being gathering together when we don't need to. They're the heroes right now. And I open up the floor. I have three hands in that order. 
I have uh, three questions. My first one is to um, the representative of the Centers of Disease Control uh, and Prevention. We know that the U.S. government really assisted us with the first pandemic, um, the AIDS pandemic, and we have PEPFAR. When are we going to see PEP, PEP, what is it, PEPCOR, President's Emergency Plan for COVID relief? And the reason I'm asking is that we know that the U.S. actually has the latest technologies in terms of testing for this uh, virus. Uh, Abbott Labs has a test that they are using actually already in the U.S. that gives you the result within a few minutes, not hours or days, minutes. And if we had that in Namibia, our population is small, we could really test a lot of people and determine our cases quickly. Uh, the next question I have is, um, could you please um, explain to us what is the, the rationale behind trying to estimate the basic reproductive number for this virus in Namibia? We already have an estimate of the number uh, in Wuhan, China, between two and three, meaning between two and three people are expected on average to become infected when you introduce one positive case in a population that has no uh, positive cases. But yesterday, our health minister alluded to the fact that we're trying to estimate it in Namibia. So can you please elaborate on why we would want to do that if we already know it in Wuhan, China? And then the last question I have, uh, I think it's really one that's so important, and I think I just asked to uh, all of you, including yourself, Honorable, is what, what coordination is there between the different donors? We have China, we have the U.S., we may have other donors, but who's actually coordinating and making sure there's no duplication of efforts? Thank you. Thank you very much. So I can speak to what the U.S. government is doing here. Uh, the Pancho mentioned PEPFAR. Uh, because of PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Program for Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, we have a lot of people as part of the U.S. Embassy who are working on health issues here in Namibia long term. That's been really actually, I think, a benefit in the COVID-19 response because we were already here partnering together with good relationships. I didn't come here for COVID-19. I've lived here in Windhoek with my family for a couple of years. Uh, I have a large staff of Americans and Namibians and other nationalities that are really working to support Ministry of Health on uh, the HIV and the tuber tuberculosis programs. But now many of us are full-time working on COVID-19 because we know that that's where the need is. So myself, at least six of my staff have entirely stopped other work to focus on COVID but it's entirely within the ministry's work. And I think this answers a little bit of the third question about coordination. We don't have a US government embassy COVID response that we're doing here or a CDC response. We're part of the government of Namibia's overall response. We have people in the different teams working on laboratory, working on surveillance, working on case management looking at coordination, looking at the ports of entry. So we are just offering our support and the resources we have. That does include bringing some physical resources when we can for the United States, but it's all coordinated with one response. It wouldn't do us any good to have a lot of different responses happening around the country. It needs to be unified. Let me maybe perhaps speak to the question of coordination of don donations. We know that the various stakeholders are offering donations to government in order to respond to the COVID uh, uh, virus. Some are monetary contributions, some are in-kind contributions, some are professional services, and so forth. Uh, what has been decided um, is that because the ministry has developed a costed plan uh, for COVID response, uh, however, the we, we, we also know that uh, an emergency, a state of emergency has been declared. And under the state of emergency, the financial resources come from the uh, emergency fund, which is within the office of the prime minister. Therefore, it was decided that all monetary contributions that are coming in and that, that are being offered should be coordinated centrally at the office of the prime minister. Uh, because that is where the, resource, the financial resources would be located. With respect to other equipment, and also I want to add, for example, also those that 
are pledging to donate food items and so forth, because the office of the, minister, uh, the, office of the prime minister has got uh, the warehouses and the storage capacity, these food items that are coming in kind should also be channeled to the office of the prime minister because they have the capacity to store. The, office of the minister of health and social services does not have that capacity to store food items. And also, the, it is the office of the prime minister that has got the capacity to be able to distribute. However, when it comes to clinical supplies and medical equipment, those must necessarily come to the Ministry of Health and Social Services because we are the ones uh, operating in the facilities. Yeah. So, uh, again, in line with our costed plan, we have listed, we have a list of all the items that we require. There is a lot of talk about ventilators and so forth, but we know that we need uh, personal protective equipment we still need pharmaceuticals uh, because people who are uh, affected by the coronavirus still need to get a supportive treatment uh, where we should provide them with certain pharmaceuticals and so forth. So all these medically related matters, that those are being coordinated by the Minister of Health and Social Services on the basis of the costed plan that was developed with the input from our experts in various fields. So that is how the coordination is being done. And we want to make sure that, for example, if uh, we have indicated, for example, that for the, an effective uh, response in terms of the estate, estimated numbers of the worst case scenario, we may need up to 100 ventilators. Now, it cannot be that uh, if the ministry buys, let's say, 80 of them and there are other offers for uh, 20 or 30 more, perhaps those resources can be channeled to something else so that we don't have an oversupply in one area while there will be shortages in other areas. So we want a balanced approach to this thing and uh, that is being done on the basis of our costed plan that we developed. And that is how we are talking to the various uh, stakeholders that are offering support. So that we are saying if in this area we are uh, fairly covered, we, we, we indicate that uh, that is the case so that they can uh, respond in other areas. Yeah, it's also a question about the rate. Yeah. Yes. Maybe I can answer just quickly the question about the reproductive number of the virus. This gets a little confusing sometimes, uh, but the virus does have a reproductive number, how easily it spreads between people uh, in a general situation, if we're not doing anything to try to stop that spread. But we also talk about an effective reproductive number, what it actually looks like in a setting based on what kind of measures we are doing to stop it. So I think that's our interest here in Namibia, just like in all other countries, is to know how are our prevention measures affecting that? Is the virus less likely to spread in the community because of what we're doing? It's important to know that so we keep applying the right interventions. Okay, thank you very much, sir. The opportunity is yours. Oh, good morning, everybody. Good morning to the panelists. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Eric can answer this question. Um, the question has been actually making rounds in our live broadcast is um, there seems to be a little bit of confusion um, from ordinary people out there. Like how could the virus be killed by sanitizers but it cannot be cured? Uh, maybe Dr. Eric or the ED can perhaps dive into this and give more clarification on this because we couldn't really shut them down or ignore their question as to, we believe there's not really a silly question. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my question maybe can be answered by both uh, panelists. Uh, my name is Fidel from the Parliament Studio. Um, I wanted to find out, like when I saw the news today, um, 15,000 people have died in Spain, 18,000 in Italy, and of course we also have our own cases, which is 16 confirmed cases of the COVID-19. Um, looking at all these statistics, um, so I wanted to find out in terms of Namibia, how ready are we from the start of the Ministry of Health to, in terms of medical equipments that are possibly coming from one of those countries in order for us to be prepared uh, when such times that we actually require this medical equipment? Because I understand there's a backlog and all the shipments have been stopped from China and Hong Kong. And uh, my second question is, um, 
uh, I think two days ago, we had um, guests here where the, the confidentiality of those that are tested positive cannot be revealed. Uh, what I wanted to find out as well is uh, for those that have recovered from the COVID-19, as media houses, do we have access to speak to them so that we can actually find out about their own experience um, thereafter? They have recovered, so do, do we possibly have access? We want to hear their stories. We want to know uh, what has been their experience and what is the way forward. Thank you. So I'll, I'll start with that first question. It's, I'm, I'm glad you raised it because I think this can be confusing to people. How can you have a virus that's easy to kill outside your body with something like hand sanitizer or bleach? but then inside your body, we don't have a cure. And the trick is that when the virus gets in your body, it gets into your cells. And the things that can kill that virus on the outside, they can't go into your body. They're poisonous to your body too. They could kill the virus inside of you, but then it would damage or kill you as well. And this is really true for all viruses. Really, any virus out there, we have ways to kill it if it's on this table, if it's on this chair, if it's on the floor. We have strong chemicals that are able to kill viruses on surfaces, but those chemicals, if we tried to put them into our body where the virus is, like into our lungs, where the coronavirus would be, would do much more damage to us. So this is why we have these two situations, a virus that we don't have a cure yet for when it's in us, but we know it's actually very easy to kill when it's outside. So let's focus our efforts there. Let's kill that virus when it's on our hands and it's very easy to kill it and not let it get into our bodies where we know it's so much harder. I just wanted to, to, to make that clear again around that when it gets into your body, because it is some sort of living organism, it multiplies, it becomes part of your body and then that becomes difficult to actually kill it. Just a little bit of emphasis on that. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and this is how germs work. They get into our body, usually just a small number of bacteria or a small number of viruses, and then they start using our bodies as a factory where they can make more and more and more billions. There are billions of those virus particles inside someone who's infected. And so unless we have an effective cure, we can't wash them out. Uh, but your body works to fight it. And most people who get this coronavirus infection, who get COVID-19, their bodies will clear it out eventually. They have an illness and then they recover because your body fights it using your immune system. Mm -hmm. It just takes time. And unfortunately for some people, their bodies aren't able to overcome the virus. And those are the ones we're most worried about. Mr. Nangwambe. Yeah, I think there, there was a question about stoppage of shipments for equipment. At this point, uh, we don't have information that uh, shipments from China or other suppliers have actually stopped. We are sourcing as a ministry from various sources around the world. Uh, we have received indication that uh, uh, our orders will be honored. So um, we should be able to receive uh, what it is that we want. Public may have also heard about um, possible um, stoppage of export of uh, clinical items from South Africa and so forth. Through diplomatic channels, uh, that hurdle has been crossed and uh, we will be able to, or we are able to source items uh, from South Africa uh, for, you know, for, for our needs. So that also has, has been cleared. Uh, with respect to the question of disclosing the identity of those that are affected with the coronavirus. Again, as my director of primary health care uh, articulated it here the other day, we are saying that each and every person has got a right to privacy. And in my discussions with my colleagues, I give a scenario to say, a person may be affected by coronavirus, but they may be suffering from another ailment. And if it is, the demand is that we show the people who are affected by coronavirus while they are in a clinical setting or they are at home. How do you then differentiate that this person, the ailment that he has is a coronavirus ailment or is some other underlying ailment? So we as a ministry, are of course obliged to protect the dignity of each and every patient 
each and every client that comes into our health facilities. That is important. Uh, if it is a question of whether members of the media may, for example, interview people who have been affected, that is a personal decision of the people affected. The ministry cannot compel them to say, go and speak to the media about your experience. Because each and every person, as we said, is entitled to their right to privacy, is entitled to their dignity, and it's our obligation as a ministry to protect that. Thank you very much, Edi. I just wanted to find out, I had one question, in terms of effectiveness in sharing of information on COVID-19 in this centre as well. I'm asking this because I've been speaking to a couple of people that live on the phone, that live in rural areas, and some have an understanding that uh, you get COVID-19 through sexual contact, for example. So yes, I just wanted to, to really get a, a view from the, uh, from the panellists on how effective the whole sharing of information is on COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the floor is yours. Does chloroquine help? And the United States President has um, tweeted something about uh, potentially withdrawing funding from the World Health Organization. Is that the right message that we need right now? And what's the potential impact if this is to happen? We have had that donation from China to UK and other countries were contaminated or faulty. First of all, I, I would like the CDC to confirm whether that information is correct. And if it is correct, how much less can their donation to Africa be? And does the Minister of Health have some mechanism or ways to check these items, whether they are contaminated or not, before they are given to the Namibian public? And then, um, the last one is, yeah, we have some recovered cases of the COVID in, in Namibia. There are some people who are interested in knowing what are you treating them on? What therapy are they on? Thank you. We know that we spread uh, viruses like this coronavirus that causes COVID-19 when we're sharing air, when we're breathing in close uh, proximity to each other, when you have very little distance between each other. So you can imagine that through relationships like that, uh, COVID could spread. But I think your question was broader to the idea of getting information out to rural areas. And to that, and, and the ED may have uh, things he wants to say as well, we need many different approaches and we've seen them used. So it's not just this time here in the TV studio, it's a lot of time on the radio, it's sending text messages, it's communicating with village elders or community leaders who can then spread the word. It's making sure that the clinics in every region and every district of this country have all the right information so that they can be sharing it with the people that are coming to them with questions as well. Uh, the, Namibia has a large network of health educators, community health workers uh, on different uh, topics, such as those that work with us and the ministry on HIV, and they're being informed in how they can spread the right messages about COVID-19 as well. Maybe I could just add that before, ED. Um, just yesterday, we also launched a lot of material right here at the center um, through our partners at World Health Organization and DWN, where we translated um, information into local languages such as um, Silozi or Chirero or Shuambo Afrikaans and so on, so that those physical pamphlets and leaflets get to the communities and the healthcare facilities to communicate how one one can actually prevent getting the virus or if they contracted what they need to do to be able to report themselves and so on. So I think, um, like Dr. Eric said, the approach is very multi-sectoral. Um, everyone is trying their best to get information out in the different avenues that are available. I'm sure most of us have gotten SMSs from the Ministry of Health. I'm sure through television and radio we're hearing these messages. I think it's also to a large extent uh, an understanding of the messages being communicated. But of course, there are a lot of stakeholders on the ground also trying to, to support that. And I think the ED can assist with that. We have a specific theme group dealing with what is called risk communications and community engagement. And it is that theme group that is developing together with stakeholders the education uh, information communication material. And that is very important because we need to spread the message using various uh, uh, platforms, using various technologies, whether it is newspapers, whether it's billboards, whether it's leaflets, whether it is our 
community, uh, community health extension workers, and all those. And I just want to add, at the very beginning of the outbreak, uh, we engaged in what is called the training of trainers, so that we, we brought people together and gave them information on exactly what to do in their local settings. Because this is not an issue of, that is being uh, driven only from the center. We need to ensure that our district hospitals, our health centers, and our clinics are able to pass on the message to members of the public exactly on how our people ought to behave. And it's not only the health sector that ought to be involved in this. Uh, our traditional leaders, our spiritual leaders, and even the local and regional government structures also need to come on board. And they have come on board uh, in order to be able to educate uh, members of the public on how to behave again. The central message is this is really an individual action that is going to make a difference. That the way each and every person behaves is what is going to determine whether Namibia defeats this uh, virus or we move to a worst case scenario. So it's important that as the information goes out there, and I'm glad that we, we now have materials that we have um, translated into the local languages. And again, the, the, there was also an aspect of us ensuring that, for example, the material is developed for the visually impaired persons so that they also can access information when they need to do so. And the important medium, of course, being the radio, uh, and it's not only NBC radio, we are talking about uh, the private radio stations in the country, and I'm glad that those have also come on board. Uh, and we must spread a consistent message. We must spread a consistent message. We want all Namibians, all shapers of public opinion in the country to be singing the same song that the people must comply with the messages that are out there, with the measures that have been put in place in order to combat and control the spread of the virus. Thank you. There was a question around chloroquine, um, if it assists with the recovery of, of those infected with the virus. So as of right now, Namibia has not recommended its use. They're still waiting to see for more evidence come out. Uh, other countries that are doing studies in this to determine whether the government here wants to recommend its use for people with COVID-19. And then there was a question of um, faulty equipment. For us, of course, we, we don't only receive equipment and start using it. Our health professionals and our medical engineers that we have are trained to determine whether a piece of equipment is correctly calibrated in order to be able to do what it ought to do when it is uh, placed in a clinical setting. So um, if anything, of course, our people should be able to tell that this machine, this piece of equipment is doing what it ought to do or is not providing the correct readings. So. Um, I think that is it's, it's, it's an issue that we have to be uh, cognizant of and uh, just to make sure that uh, our professionals are, are able to, to, to tell whether the equipment that has been provided uh, is effective and is working as it is supposed to. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we now have time for your final words, just in one minute. Um, message to the public around all these myths and untruths about COVID-19 and what they can do better to ensure that they do not believe some of those myths. Yeah, I think this was a, a helpful time together and I hope that the word can get out. Uh, I'll go back to my message that there's so many good sources of information out there, but then there's also these myths coming through. So when you hear those myths, when they're coming by, again, stop and really decide, is this coming from a reliable source? Can I know that this is true? And if not, don't spread it around. We don't need to pass the virus around. We don't need to pass the myths around. We're all in it together. There was that question about CDC and WHO. I can speak to what's happening here in Namibia. We're working completely in unity and we're supporting the Ministry of Health. Like we said before, we are one uh, response. The ministry has been very gracious in reaching out and letting all the partners come together and work in a unified way. We live here, our families are here. We will all wanna end this virus together. We're in it till the end. Yeah, thank you very much, Minister. Um, I think what is important is to dispel the myth that 
government cannot be trusted. At the center of everything that government is doing is to protect the health and the well-being of the Namibian people. And that is, that is really all that we are doing to protect the Namibian people. In this stage of a pandemic, it's important for us to rally together as Namibians. We must rally together. We must come together as a unit, as a united force to face the, the, the enemy. And th that's what I said earlier. We must identify who the enemy is. The enemy is not the person you don't agree with politically. The enemy is not a person who is different from you. The enemy is the virus. And we must confront it as a united front. My message to the public is this. We know it is Easter. Easter is a time when Namibians families would normally come together. But because of the measures that have been put in place, we again need to limit movement. We need to adhere to the protocols of social distancing. We need to adhere to the pro protocols of washing our hands. We need to adhere to the protocols of ensuring that we protect ourselves and our families. That's the only way that we can defeat the virus. Let us therefore be calm. There shouldn't be any sense of panic because the situation is being handled by professionals in a manner that is, a, is, is designed to protect the Namibian people. So we want to wish each and every Namibian a happy Easter. It's a difficult time, but we must rally together in order to ensure that we do what is correct to protect our families, to protect ourselves, and to protect Namibia from this uh, common enemy. Thank you very much, E.D. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us the, to the end of our daily debrief talking about myths and untruths and misinformation around COVID-19 in Namibia. Please continue to adhere to the guidelines and regulations put in place and inform yourself uh, of information around COVID-19 from trusted and verified sources to ensure that we all work together to fight COVID-19 in the country. Government can do their part, but if you don't do your part as a citizen of this country, we'll find that COVID-19 will spread and we'll not be able to control it. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for your time and please join us again tomorrow. Have a happy Easter and stay safe. Namibia. <music>